Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. On Sunday, October 25, the world witnessed the Chilean people via a national plebiscite resoundingly vote to rewrite their Pinochet era constitution. This a historic defeat for neoliberalism. Today we're joined by Patricio Zamorano. He's a political analyst, journalist, and co-director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs, COHA, COHA.org. He's joining us today from Washington, DC to talk about Sunday's uh, plebiscite and um, what it was like to vote in Washington, D.C., and the resounding results and what it means for the Chilean people and the rest of us in the hemisphere of the Americas. Welcome, um, Patricio. It's so great to have you here, and I so appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Terry. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure always. Uh, thank you so much for all the attention that you're putting on what happened last Sunday. It was, it was really historic. So yeah, very, very exciting times for the Chilean people. So you're a Chilean citizen living in Washington, D.C., and you voted at the Chilean embassy on Sunday. So tell us what that was like. It was probably just very emotional and thrilling for you, I'm sure. Sure. I mean, that was something that a right to vote uh, from overseas that we didn't have like a couple of a couple of years ago, or maybe three years ago. I think 2017, maybe was 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 uh, when it, it was the first time that we were able to to do that, and uh, we have, uh, as always happens, I mean, conservative forces uh, in the country they didn't allow Chileans to vote from outside Chile, mainly because a, a big percentage of the Chilean people living overseas they were actually a former exile people from the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. So they, there was this huge population of Chileans living. Uh, in different countries, progressive people. So that's why uh, some conservative forces were against that. But at the end of the day, it took years. Oh my God, it took years uh, to fight through Congress, to find political consensus. So finally, last Sunday, I think it's the second election or maybe third election that we were, we were able to vote. And it was just amazing feeling to feel a citizen of, of your home country in the capital of the United States, yeah. So let me, before you tell us a little more about Sunday specifically, just to clarify, how were you able to vote at all? Did you have to fly home to Chile to vote or would, were you not able to vote at all living outside the United States? Yeah, I mean, at that time, uh, before the law was passed, you had to go to Chile, period. Uh, mm -hmm. Before that, for several years, both was, was a, a mandatory, actually, and in those cases, you had to go to a consulate to explain that you were living in a different country, for example. But now it's voluntary, so, um, but then we got the right uh, to vote here. And what we do, though, uh, I think in the U.S. is different when you are overseas, you are able to vote based on where you used to live or you are legal. Mm -hmm. In the United States, in, in our case, we have to change our district. So we move our electoral uh, district from Chile to Washington, D.C., in my case. So we are officially uh, residents of another country. So if I go back to, to Chile, for example, if I don't change my address, I, I, don't, I, I cannot vote. I, I, I see. So I, it's an extra process, basically, if I want to vote in Chile. Um, so it happened to me something uh, very funny in the first round of the previous presidential election. I voted here uh, on the first round. And then uh, during the second round, uh, I went to Chile, just a very uh, sudden trip. And then I was there during the, the final stage of the presidential election. And then I, I couldn't vote there because I was registered here. So <laughs> that was <laughs> the irony of that. <laughs> So you voted on Sunday. So so tell us what that was like, what it what it was personally like for you, and what it meant for uh, the Chilean people. Sure. I mean, what happened on Sunday was truly, truly historic. Everybody uh, who is watching us, I think uh, you actually saw the images, the footage, the video recordings 
of Santiago, that town there. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people celebrating since very early in the evening until the whole night, basically ha having a blast, dancing, singing, uh, uh, chanting for democracy and for the future of the country. It was really an expression of a feeling a, a alleviated after a, a whole horrible year of repression, violence, and also a beautiful, beautiful popular expressions in the streets. Um, the Chilean people, we, we have had a very tough history for the last 40 or 50 mm. years, but we're also very artistic. We, we like the street expressions, so you could see throughout, no, not only in the last year, when we have the issue with education reform and, and hundreds of thousands of students in the street of Chile, or then later on when we were fighting for democracy or, or to eliminate uh, this constitution that we got from the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, people would, would express themselves in the streets in very creative ways, with art, with music, um, with, with theater. So all that was also part of the, of the narrative of the last year. It was not just violence, although uh, everybody saw the horrible repression that the Chilean police performed on, on protesters, right? A, a, People. Well, specifically the students. I mean, the, the uprisings, the protests started with the raisin bus fares, correct? Or student yeah. fees, if, or the raisin fares for average working people. And I know some of the, the uh, photos we were seeing here in the United States were, were not unlike the photos we see coming out of Palestine with people being shot in the eye, protesters being discouraged by, you know, to, to protest by being shot in the eye with rubber bullets. I mean, that's a technique we have seen in many places. That was brutal, brutal, brutal. Uh, one of the worst cases in the world. Uh, we have never had, I think they're just, I, I believe that Chile is one of the worst, worst cases where the police uh, forces are using um, actually rubber bullets uh, hitting the eyes of people. Some people got totally blind. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple of examples, young people with uh, uh, their eyes destroyed, both of them. So it's just, it just a horrible example of a uh, repressive police force that is also under a huge crisis. I mean, the, the police institution in Chile is also super, super um, uh, uh, under a, a huge pressure for reform, uh, so it's very similar to what's what's going on here, right? With the police brutality okay. situation, yeah. Here, right? Yeah, That's the U.S. foreign policy has come home, or at least people are physically seeing it now in the streets and yeah, in the United States. But but in Chile, it's even worse. I would say, I would argue, because uh, the police forces in Chile are militarized. They are really part of the of the military tradition. So they, it's even worse. We don't have any community-based police or policing or something like that. It's just a repressive force that is about to get totally, totally reformed. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's just been horrible, the social cost for young people in the streets of Chile, yeah. So let's talk technically about what um, Sunday's national plebiscite was and what the, the, the resounding vote, yes vote, to rewrite the Constitution. What, what is the 1980 Constitution and what is the hope to, for the new Constitution? Sure, I mean, if people need to understand that this Constitution is just, uh, is bad from the origin. I mean, from, from the very beginning, this Constitution was approved in 1980. Uh, very, very dark times for the Chilean society, just in the middle of the dictatorship, a brutal, brutal dictatorship. Uh, just a few months or uh, one year or a couple of years later after the assassination of Orlando Letelier here in Washington, D.C., by a bomb mm -hmm. planted by the secret, the secret police of Pinochet. So then Pinochet and the right-wing leaders of the, of the political parties the conservative parties, especially the UDI, UDI uh, those, those people uh, had this idea, hey, 
in general, we need to create a constitution so we we create some illegitimacy, right? So we create an institutional framework that could respond to the new situation of the country. And the new situation was based on neoliberalism, the Chicago voice influence, right? That they This was the first country in the Americas, 1973. Chile was basically the petri dish for the Chicago boys. Yes, well, uh, Friedman came to Chile, actually, which is the scene that Friedman later on tried to run away from because Friedman came to Chile during the dictatorship very proud of the fact that his theories were being applied in a brutal way because I have to say, I, I was raised during the 80s. I was a child during the 80s. So I, nobody can tell me anything about that because I lived the dictatorship from the very beginning and I can tell you in the 80s was horrible. It was a horrible economic situation, a social uh, situation. The ne neoliberal neo policies were applied with no resistance because we were with curfew, after a coup d'etat, people being tortured, uh, being disappeared, exiled, terror, basically a state-sponsored terror. So then, Pinochet's regime created this referendum. They wrote down this constitution and they, with no electoral registration whatsoever, with no records, they decided that the constitution was approved by, I don't know, 90% of the population uh, with a curfew. I mean, we have curfew and then they pretended that people went to the voting polls and all that. So it was, it was just, just a charade. Basically, yeah. It's fascinating to, for me to hear what you're sharing, particularly about your childhood, because what we what what we have heard in the United States over the last 40 years is how stable Chile is. It's the most stable economy in the Americas and the and the healthiest economy. And yet, listening to you, we're hearing the absolute brutality needed in order to keep the economy stable. It's exactly that. I, I actually was interviewed this uh, yesterday, actually, by a, by a Mexican TV station as well. You, you are in Mexico now, so and they they compare they they showed me this uh, interview with this uh, conservative uh, conservative lady, and she was saying something like that. Exactly that. Hey, why they complain so much about the constitution? Chile was so awesome under the dictatorship, uh, under the government of Augusto Pinochet. The country was modern. The country was was prosperous, and then, uh, of course, I had the chance to explain that that was just a lie. It's a mirage. It's not really what happened uh, during that time. It's true. The country had macroeconomic indices that were very very strong, uh, but they only help the rich. They only help the elite, the right wing elite of the country. The population felt the hit of these neoliberal policies, uh, the hit in their lives, uh, unemployment and some sub employment was a huge. The dictatorship created this very, very extremely low salary, little uh, job program to uh, try to hide the, the actual numbers. Uh, a lot of Chileans who are listening to me, they're gonna understand the PEM and the POG those were these two weird little programs to try to hide the actual unemployment rate. People were hungry in my neighborhood. We literally, we literally were hungry because the uh, buying power of the population was extremely low. Why? Because Pinochet and the constitution of 1980 and the Chicago Voice, they privatized everything. They privatized education, they privatized the health care system, healthcare system, they privatized the pensions. They privatized absolutely everything. So basically, you had a good life, you had a good salary, a good job. But most of the population is still now. 70% of, of Chileans make less than $700 per month. It's still now. So it's not a surprise the explosion of happiness that we had just last Sunday, because it's a whole process of four decades of inequality. So all that was the dictatorship to say that it, that the country was modern and was an example of of prosperity. It's just a lie. It's not real. It was prosperous for one very small percentage. You know what's fascinating to me about 
and and we see this in the states too more and more and more and it's just great to hear you share this because i hope your words allow a lot of u.s citizens to wake up that it's very similar here this push to or there <laughs> i forget i'm in mexico talking to you right now this push for 100 percent privatization of the economy if you are not going to raise workers' wages, there is no way the average person is going to have the disposable income to pay for every single thing. If there's suppressed wages, certain aspects of a person's life have to be subsidized or socialized by the government, healthcare, education, public infrastructure. It's impossible to pay for all of that when you have a suppressed wage. And so you have neoliberalism privatizing everything going up and then the suppression of wages and how can there not be massive poverty exactly i mean if you talk to to the young people i mean polls polls are extremely extremely real i mean uh, uh, a big percentage of the population i, I think it's more than 25 percent is suffering depression right now i mean it's, it's one of the highest rates i, I think chile is is the eighth country in the in the whole world in rates of depression the inequality some uh, according to some indexes we are one of the top three countries in the whole world in inequality according to numbers from the world bank i mean the country is extremely unequal people uh, rich people are extremely rich poor people are extremely poor the middle class is so close to being poor in every single month salary by salary check by check that if you have any personal drama, a health issue, you get, you lost your job, uh, you had an accident, any of, of those incidents can push you to poverty in one minute. So that's why uh, it's, it's, um, it's a sense of being vulnerable. People believe, feel that they're vulnerable, that something's gonna happen. So imagine living like that for four decades. I mean, it's, it just, it just, it, that's why, the most neoliberal country of Latin America, the example of the Chicago Boys is surprising, quotation mark, surprising the rest of the continent by breaking apart from neoliberalism and a constitution that actually preserved those uh, fundamentals for so many years. So th there's a couple things that I want to follow up um, with you on, given your comments. One, earlier, um, let's talk about the disintegration of neoliberalism in Chile and what that means for the perhaps for the rest of the hemisphere. But before that, um, you had mentioned that the Pinochet regime had created this constitution with this false sense that the people uh, participated in its creation. So the other, there were two parts to the plebiscite on Sunday. One was yes or no, do we rewrite the constitution? And the second part was how, what Bo political body is going to be used to rewrite it. And the people did not choose to have the existing government rewrite or any government figures rewrite the constitution. They chose uh, a, a, a constitutional convention. And it's very clear. I mean, it, it's clear listening to your comments as to why that was so overwhelmingly yeah, chosen. I I mean, is the double effect. I, I would call it the double effect. I was convinced, I have to be honest, I thought, well, I think the country is, of course, ready to have a new constitution. That started with a very minor, um, isolated little group of people from the, from the left saying, we need a constitutional assembly. Uh, which, which, which created a lot of uh, antibodies because it was the same sentence, Asamblea Constituyente in Spanish, it was the same sentence used in Venezuela, in Bolivia, yeah. re refund the country, recreate the contract between mm -hmm. the state and the citizen. Uh, so especially conservative Chileans were very uh, uh, wary about that. No, we are not going to be like Venezuela, we're not going to be like Bolivia. So at the beginning, it was impossible. I mean, I, I was one of those analysts that thought it's impossible. Chile will never do something like Asamblea Constituyente where the, the population can actually participate. So uh, on Sunday, I really thought that the option to change the constitution was going to be extremely strong. 70%, 80%. It's exactly what happened, 79, 78%. The second question that you mentioned, I thought 
that the people who were going to choose or maybe 50 50 this uh, uh, hybrid convention where you were going to have regular congress people congress women congressmen uh, women uh, congress people basically uh, that were going to be uh, maybe half or or part of that uh, convention and then the rest of the uh, deputies were going to be elected by vote. Um, I was extremely surprised that uh, that second option got is also 80 percent, 78 percent. I mean, impressive. It means people want to participate, and it means Terry something extremely interesting. Uh, we have to remember that the Chilean vote for the right-wing parties is always uh, still strong. It's 30 percent minimum. 40 percent, it goes up. Piñera won with a very strong vote, so uh, 50 plus percent, right? So in that 80 percent, we have people who are conservative and who want, who understood the need, the need to create a new contract between the state and the citizens, and that's beautiful. It's beautiful that we have a concern wow. that this is for all of us. It's not just for the left. It's just it's not just for the right. We need to recreate the country in a better way uh, and to eliminate inequality. Yeah. That is, that's extraordinarily hopeful. I mean, that, that allows you to really believe in the possibility of success when you, when you have people of a mixed political philosophies. That's incredible. That's so hopeful, and, it, and it's so yeah. encouraging, and it's such a fantastic example of what's possible. But, but still, we have to remember this. The right-wing sectors of the country, they were, uh, at the end of the day, they had to agree, because they, they saw that the, that the force of the popular expression was so huge that at the end of the day, and, and you can hear President Piñera with this message of, of conciliation, of, of consensus, and, and saying the people have spoken, and we need to change this constitution. We need a constitution who is gonna, uh, his words where we cannot uh, have a constitution that divide us. We need to, we need a constitution that is gonna unite us. So that was a very strong message, and I think it's, it's also very pragmatic because they didn't have another option. I mean, 80% is just impossible to refuse. So now, now is the uh, the uh, the risk. The risk is that uh, those 155 deputies that are going to be elected on April 2021 those are gonna be elected by the population, but the right-wing parties, they, they have the right to compete as well. And they have a lot of funds. So uh, don't get me wrong, they're, they're gonna fight for every single deputy uh, as much as possible and the progressive forces, of course. But the beautiful thing is we have certain rules. It has to be gender balanced. It has to be 50% women, 50% men, which is great. We have to get representation of indigenous people. We have to get the representation of, um, of unions, of uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the professional schools that we call in Chile, meaning the association of doctors, the association of teachers, the association of, of uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all, all, all those social activities. So the, the goal and the challenge here is to create a democratic representation in those among those 155 deputies. And that's the challenge that we need to face now. Well, it's hopeful. And it's such, a, it's such an important message of people power for, you know, and not just for, for Chile, but for the world as a whole, what's possible. And especially on the weekend, right after what we witnessed in Bolivia, we have seen two huge, enormous governmental and political impacts by people, by movements, by people deciding their future and their politics. Yeah. What do you think all of this means for the United States? The United States has presidential elections on November 3rd, next week. What do you see, um, 
How do you see the results in, in Chile on Sunday affecting the U.S. people? I would tell you that the political class here in the U.S. was totally, it is totally disconnected from what's really going on in Latin America. And I have to tell you, before the Chilean uh, uh, huge uh, and historic event last Sunday, we had the Bolivia situation, as, as you mentioned. Um, it was a big surprise, the fact that the United States was very fast, even the Organization of American States, that actually it was part of the scandal of the of the so-called fraud that created the coup d'etat, and a lot of universities of the United States were very clear that the OAS, the Organization of American States, it, it was really um, they were the ones who created the fraud by uh, uh, doing these mistakes, so-called mistakes. Uh, when they were analyzing the results. We know now that Evo Morales actually won that election. And, so, and just for our viewers, for this was, we're talking about October 2019, the, the yes. first president, yeah. So the point I want to make is, after all that, the support of the United States to the coup d'etat in Bolivia against Evo Morales, the support of the OAS to the coup d'etat, then Luis Arce camp, uh, together with the rest of the of the mass movement, the uh, movement towards socialism, the MAS, uh, the party of Evo Morales, they organized elections. They they faced a lot of prosecutions, legal uh, challenges that the dictatorship actually put uh, upon them. And then they they won in one of the highest rates in Bolivian history, and then the United States was very fast to congratulate Luis Arce. I mean, that was, for me, it was very weird. I mean, how is that possible that that they didn't even try to do anything? Because they got surprised, basically. They never expected that, right? After, it doesn't happen that after a coup d'etat or organized or, or backed by the United States and by the OS that the, the, the previous political party, the Socialist Party of Bolivia, comes back to power through legal and legitimate elections. So it was really, really, you are right. I, I mean, in two weeks, we have this a strong expression of, of legitimate, popular expression that you cannot deny or you cannot uh, 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 deny at all, basically. They are so... No, it was just a resounding defeat, pretty much resounding defeat of all forms of U.S. influence and interference in both countries, economic, militarily, politically. It, it's a real statement of people wanting their countries back and a great sense of national sovereignty. Sure. I mean, and the fact that the U.S. is disconnected from the reality. I mean, they, I think after Luis Arce won, by a huge advantage of 20 points over Carlos Mesa and, and Camacho, I think then the United States understood, I mean, what the hell? I mean, we are <laughs> wrong here. I mean, the people, I mean, Evo Morales was the leader of this new era of Bolivian, uh, Bolivian history. Um, and people actually responded to the great uh, economics of the Evo Morales government the fact that they they created wealth for the indigenous people. It's not just socialist. I don't agree with it, just socialism. No, no, no. Evo Morales also created the tools uh, to for, for indigenous people and especially indigenous women to be part of the market as well and to compete in the market and to and to and, and to be part of that in a democratic way. And also the fact that they were able to nationalize the gas and the and the minerals, they created a, a huge social agenda to cover all those aspects of where the market is not as strong enough, right? So it's a beautiful, beautiful balance. And I think the, the Bolivian people, after a, a year of dictatorship, they realized this is not what we're, what we're looking for. We really support what the Evo Morales uh, uh, party was actually doing for the last year. So they responded to that in a, in a very honest way. And I think the United States had to accept that reality. So, yeah. Well, so now we see the Chilean people 
wanting the same thing, the end of neoliberalism and an opportunity for everyone to participate in the economy, women, men, people of all ethnic backgrounds, and a, a pathway to education, to healthcare, to uh, participation in, in the economy and the society as a whole. Exactly. And, and I, Sunday's plebiscite really uh, is the opening to creating all of that for the Chilean people. And that's, that's the irony of the situation. We were discussing with our editorial board at the Council on Hemispheric Affairs yesterday. We were analyzing all these elements, right, of the last two weeks. And we agreed that, uh, and we wrote a couple of pieces actually about the Chilean situation uh, uh, coming towards the referendum. Uh, the fact that the Chicago voice and the dictatorship at the beginning of the 80s, they really created this irony. They were talking about their narrative was about freedom, uh, liberty, uh, the fact uh, open markets, right? Uh, all that was- Open the, markets for whom though? Exactly. All that was <laughs> open markets for whom? It was in contradiction to the actual situation of, of the workers of the country. So they didn't, they, they didn't allow the workers of the country to enjoy that freedom, to enjoy that market, to, to enjoy that with, with good salaries, good health care, as you were mentioning at the beginning of the interview. So they actually, um, they, uh, they play against their own values by also doing political repression. So they believe in liberty, they believe in freedom, also only in very narrow senses, just for the elite, just for the economy, but not for political uh, uh, purposes, right? So socially, they repress the people economically, they open the markets for an elite, and politically, they also repress. So it doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not liberty, that's not freedom. So that's the irony of the situation, right? So what happens next, Patricio? What, what happens next in the Americas? Is this, I mean, I'm listening to you talk and there's so many things you've said. I could talk to you for hours about this. You know, one of the things that I try to share with people uh, when I come back from traveling, particularly Latin America, uh, delegations or personal travel like I'm doing now, um, US citizens do not understand, and you talked about this so beautifully earlier, the absolute brutal force that it takes to support a neoliberal government. Uh, the, the political suppression, the social suppression, and, and, and military suppression. It, it's a brutal, brutal form of economy. And it's simply about profit and, and where does a certain, demog certain population of the planet place its capital? Because it, it, like you said, it just does not benefit society as a whole. Sure, I mean that's that's the irony that I was I was talking about. Uh, uh, we want people to be free, uh, which is uh, just an abstract value. Okay, yeah, we want people to to be free, but free with 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 no healthcare, free with no jobs with very bad salaries, uh, where big companies basically, they actually profit uh, from the sacrifice of millions of people. I mean, in, in Chile, the situation is really, is, is so unequal that it's morally, morally unacceptable. And I think at the end of the day, what happened on Sunday is that uh, morally, the whole population, including the elite, they realize we cannot uh, sustain this anymore. I mean, it's been so bad. I was in Chile actually a couple of times during the last year. The level of this combination of the of social depression, people sad about the situation of the country, all these years of sacrifice and and people were not able to fulfill the expectations of the social contract, right? Like that, I'm going to have a good job. I'm going to raise children. They're going to go to college, right? I'm going to buy a car. I'm going to have a, 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 a house that is, is, is 
dignified. All that didn't exist for so many years. So we're talking about people here. We're not talking about uh, ideologies, right? So that's why we have that 80% of support last Sunday. This is not about the political parties. This is about the, the, the human lives of 17 million Chilean uh, people. So um, uh, I have hope for the future of my, of my home country. I believe that what happened on Sunday is uh, the beginning of a new era. I'm, I'm convinced about that because the mobilization was so wide and broad that nobody will be able to stop that. Uh, hopefully we, we won't have more violence. Violence was horrible for so many families, for police officers, for protesters, for young people, horrible. So we expect that the repression level will be decreased. We expect police reform. We expect justice for so many police officers that had committed so many violations of human rights, not only now, during the dictatorship, oh, oh my God, those cases are still open. But still, I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from what happened last Sunday. Well, I'm so happy for you. I'm happy for you and all the people of Chile, and I'm happy about the message the encouraging message it sends you know, to all of us about what's possible. And I'm so thankful that you had time to join us today. I know you are working in a thousand different directions, especially running up to, uh, to the elections in the States on the third. So thank you so much, Patricio. I just want to remind our, our viewers that Patricio Zamorano is co-director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs, COHA, COHA.org, correct? Dot org. And uh, so thank you again, and I hope all of you uh, join us every Wednesday, noontime Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, on Code Pink's YouTube channel. This is What the F is Going On in Latin America. Thanks again, Patricio. So wonderful to talk with you. Thank you so much, and I, I invite all, uh, all viewers, just go to coja.org, C-O-H-A.org. We do analysis uh, every week about what's going on in Latin America. So thank you so much for listening and uh, th thank you so much Terry for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to dialogue with you about what's going on in Latin America. <laughs> well, you as well. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.